now. Big experience, big change. An unprecedented look. It's a sad thing. At an American emergency. There was never a debate. The winters are not as cold or as long. Happening right here. Yeah, what's going on now on the planet? Whoa! Why are these people about to lose their homes? That's how we survive in the Arctic. Copy, thanks for the info, Brett. What has lit more wildfires than ever before? A lot of different weather patterns that I've noticed. How are these homes sinking into the ground? Right now we're about 70 feet below the surface. We go underground and above. Alaska, state of emergency. Here's Dave Malkoff. Welcome to Alaska. Since you are watching this on YouTube, you're in for a treat. You can watch the entire special right here in stunning 4K Ultra HD. This state is known as America's majestic last frontier, but you could just as easily call it the climate change state. The evidence is all around us. To start off our storytelling, let's get you on a bush plane, take you up north of the Arctic Circle to a community on the brink. Welcome aboard Highland Aviation. This Cessna Grand Caravan has many safety features on board. While our puddle jumper is relatively safe, that island down there called Kivalina no longer is. Winter storms are literally eating the village alive. Crashing ocean waves are eroding the island, once protected by huge chunks of sea ice. It's like a buffer. Whoa! And now it's into the winters where we get rain in January when it used to be minus 30, minus 40, minus 50. The 400 people of Kivalina could soon become America's first climate change refugees. Basically, that is what we would be, refugees. Meet Colleen Swan. In recent years, she's become kind of the voice of Kivalina. Kivalina is on the northwest coast of Alaska, above the Arctic Circle. This tiny village is home to about 400 native Alaskans. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if everyone were related in this village. The kids and their parents live off the land, very much like their ancestors did. That's how we survive in the Arctic. You eat what, you, what survives up here. But now, as tall waves can blow ice cold water clear across the island, their lives are changing here. As politicians in Washington debate if climate change is real, here in Kivalina. There was never a debate, you know, we just saw these changes happening and... It's a sad thing. Colleen's dad has lived here for 80 years. His hunting grounds used to be out there on the solid blocks of ice during the winter. Uh, bearded seal, whale. Muktuk. Fish. Muktuk. Belugas. Or beluga is hard to come by these days. The people in Kivalina believe changing climate and noise from a nearby mine has changed their migratory pattern. Everything is gone. The ocean is empty like. As recently as the 1970s and 80s, village elders remember the winter Arctic sea ice growing to 10 feet in thickness. But this past year, it came down to three feet not thick enough to hunt on and not thick enough to protect the village either. The climate change has caused so much problem. But it's not just the village elders saying that, it's actually the federal government. A congressional audit and the Army Corps of Engineers have identified four Alaskan villages in dire need of immediate relocation. They specifically say climate change is the problem here and have started to spend millions to protect this place. The Corps sent the big uh, super sacks these rock boxes were Kivalina Protection version 1.0, but the storms were still too powerful. And it was because the ice was not there. We used that until the Corps was able to come in with this rock that came from Nome. For now, the big rock wall is holding just barely. The plan is actually to move the entire ancient community. Our, our Eskimo dancing, you know, the spirituality is high to our subsistence lifestyle. Everybody needs to move off the island. We have to keep our lifestyle alive. Kivalina Village is the only one without running water. Lucy Adams is also in her 80s, but almost every day, when it's warm enough, her son takes her out on an hour-long motorboat ride to this stunning field of green, spongy tundra. 
where the wild berries grow. Yeah, they're ripe now. They're ready to eat. Lucy and her son pick blueberries and these things called salmon berries while the kids go off and look for animals to hunt. A caribou, female. And remember, they're not picking berries or hunting for fun. This is their way of life. This is how they sustain themselves. Everything has changed. How we, how we gather our food, all of it has changed. They've ripened a lot earlier than we expected. We just adapted to those changes because they were subtle. Even with help from the federal government, building a new Kivalina with new homes for everybody, a new school for the kids, new airport, new roads, it's costly, $180 million or more. We, we, we don't have $180 million. So for now, Kivalina will stay where it is, isolated on an island. Their protection and their lifestyle slowly melting around them. While the ice melt here above the Arctic Circle is changing their entire way of life, meanwhile, in the center part of the state, the problem is fire. been here for the last two seasons as a smoke jumper. Cale Donnelly doesn't know it yet, but his crew is just about to hear another fire alarm here at what they call the Jump Shack. This is the plane he will soon jump from, right into the heart of a wildland fire. Alaska is so big, look at it compared to the rest of the country, that there is no other way to fight these kinds of fires than this. parachute jump into some of the most remote woods you'll find in this nation. Listen for a bit and land with a hero sent from the sky. I got you, Lynn, you're good! <laughs> and experts say as Alaska gets hotter and drier due to climate change, this kind of thing is going to break out more often. It already is. Yeah, you know, there's still a lot of large fires out there that uh, are getting beat down by a little bit of rain. Chance of precip, pretty low over most of the state. Meteorologist back at the Jump Shack says all the rain in the past few days... Okay, yesterday's weather... ...has uh, put most of the fires down. Still unstable in the southeast corner of the state. But we wanted to get a first-hand look. The only way to truly know if a fire is worth sending the smoke jumpers is from a seat in one of these recon planes. The firefight here in Alaska has taken us 6,000 feet above the ground in this Aero Commander. Look out the window, you can actually see Denali. It looks like a cloud, but that's actually a mountain. Beautiful landscape out there, but it's burning right now at possible record levels. Up front, we've got our pilot and fire spotter. In the back, it's Adam Coli. He's what's called a forestry technician with the Alaska Fire Service. Why can't you get the information about where the fires are from satellites? Oh, we can, actually. Uh, one of the limitations in that is the uh, we're only getting uh, satellite you know, imagery or the satellite uh, information every 12 hours. And so this is instant, looking out the windows with your own eyeballs? Of course. In 2015 alone, more than 700 wildfires have burned in Alaska. We're talking more than 5 million acres torched. That's more wildfire than in California, more than in the American West, more, in fact, than the entire rest of the country combined. In this one state. So if we look at the state right here, where are we going in Alaska? Okay, we're going right here, uh, about uh, 100 miles uh, southwest of Fairbanks. That looks right in the center of Alaska. Right in the center of Alaska. And there it was. Flame lengths up to 50 feet. Smoke so heavy, you could actually smell it up here. Good to go to get everyone started off. And close enough to a cabin. Copy, thanks for the info, Brett. To call the jump shack. And the team they called out? You guessed it. So we actually will jump out of the side door. Kale Donnelly and three other smoke jumpers, boots on the smoldering ground. The uh, fire could be getting, uh, you know, across the drainage from the cabin here. You know, pulling the trigger on those smoke jumpers is something this crew takes very seriously. Once those guys hit the ground, 
They could be there for 21 days or more. It's just about the least fun you can have on a camping trip. You will go inside this remote Alaska fire camp when we return. Alaska, state of emergency. Here's Dave Malkoff. Welcome back. We are on the fire line here in Alaska. This crew is returning from the Aggie Creek fire. 31,000 acres burned, started by a lightning strike. Seems big, but this is considered a small fire in this wild season here in the state of Alaska. We're already looking at millions of acres burned this season, and experts we've been talking to say this could be what we see in the future as well. We went up 100 fires in like a week, you know, in one week, 100 new starts. And so when that happens, it's basically prioritize which fires we're going to end up actually taking action on. Those aren't city names down there. Those are fires. Alaska has burned through more acres than any other state this year. Uh, burning 4 million acres in three weeks is significant. Our, our fire records here go back about uh, 60 years. This is one of hundreds of fire camps set up by a tough group of men and women who spend up to a month isolated in deep burning woods. Al Laurent has been on this one for 10 days. 10 days is nothing. About 20 days or something. All in a state you may think of as cold and wet. That is changing. Drier earlier than it, it normally is up here in Alaska. Let's take a look at just the numbers here. Each dot represents a year between 1950 and today. Some years here in Alaska, we have almost no wildfires above 1,000 acres. Some years, there's more than 100. But don't just look at the dots. Look at the average. For some reason or another, that average is on its way up. The trend appears to be more large-scale fires there's been some work done by modelers looking at climate that do suggest that we will have longer fire seasons and probably larger fire seasons. This is my 17th season. We got socked in so bad, the smoke covered us, and we had to exchange our camp from one spot to another. He's saying they had to pick up everything, all of this gear, the entire campsite, and quickly move it away to a secondary location. Imagine doing all that work right in the middle of a massive firefight. That, apparently, is the new reality up north. A lot of different weather patterns that I've noticed. We had fallout from the smoke. A lot of stuff's hotter and drier. I think it's a, you know, a lot of fires are going to be like this in the future, especially if there's less snow. Some of these wildfires, even in unoccupied areas of Alaska, can get real dangerous real fast. Look how close this burn zone came to the famous Trans-Alaska Pipeline, 800 miles of crude oil going from the top to the bottom of the state. This is one resource those firefighters do not want to end up charged. There's pipeline down there, but there are also occupied cabins in isolated areas. That's why these elite firefighters are jumping out of planes more than ever. It's the only way to get to these remote fires. Food, water, and fuel all float down from the sky. Those firefighters down there are just getting started. Glaciers in the Arctic moving, calving, and melting at exponential rates. It's the most iconic image when you think of global climate change. Welcome back to Alaska. I'm Dave Malkoff, standing on the Harding Ice Field. This is the remnant of a giant ice sheet that covered this part of southern Alaska some 10,000 years ago. That's Alaska's history. But the ice on the surface isn't the only thing that keeps the past alive. There is ice just underneath our feet that's alive as well. This is Ruth's house. Ah, well, I'm Ruth Bacchioni. And this is Ruth's late husband, Peter. December will be 30 years since he passed on. The house Peter built never had a chance. Much of Alaska sits on a foundation of ice. The floor would get wavy like this. When that ice warms, it swallows buildings. The stove, you can't cook. The frying pan would slide on the stove. There's only so long you can live your life on an angle. You don't want your soup pouring over here when you're supposed to be eating up here, right? So what's truly going on here? What is causing Alaska to sink like this? 
Well, to truly understand that, we need to take you underground. Right now, we're about 70 feet below the surface inside of permafrost. Permafrost is frozen soil and other stuff, too. Part of a shoulder blade, probably of a bison. A 14,000-year-old animal packed away in deep freeze. So my name is Chris Heimstra. Dr. Heimstra works in a tunnel the U.S. Army carved into the living ice that sits below Alaska. The ice is pretty easy to find. As temperatures rise, this permafrost thaws out. Home's where your heart is. <laughs> well, that's what turned Ruth's life upside down. Guarding yourself, you know, as you walk because it's not level. That thermal environment has been changing because her house is there. And when you have a permafrost there, which is really well, hard, solid ice. Yeah. it's solid ice. But and when you thaw that out, it turns into mud. And it just sinks down. Like and this. it subsides, yes. There's something else happening here, even more troubling than sinking homes. <laughs> You gotta do what you have to do to live in a home, I guess. I don't know. Now, Ruth eventually built a new house, but as the frozen north defrosts... Life in the north is being impacted really heavily by what's going on now on the planet. Permafrost holds carbon in the ground so it doesn't get into the atmosphere. It's history frozen in time. Here in this ancient stream bed, we found this stick carbon dated at 43,000 years old. Where you don't want it to go is into the atmosphere. But that's exactly what it will do if that stick comes out of this freezer. That's what permafrost is. It's a freezer locking ancient plants and animals away underground where they can't rot and give off greenhouse gases. Even a few degrees of warming starts to unplug the freezer. It's easy to get a couple of degrees up when it's at minus 2C to get it to zero, and when that happens, you get, it thaws out. Hey, remember our friends on the disappearing island of Kivalina? Our land started falling away, and it was because the ice was not there to buffer the, the storm and to protect our island. That area in northern Alaska sits on permafrost too, and the ocean waves are eating it away. Look at this time lapse. to really watch now because a lot of changes have taken place, quite a bit. With sea ice gone, you tend to get more wave action, and that physical action and that warmer water is definitely impacting that, that coastal surface and eroding that coastline dramatically every year. Each chunk that thaws gives off a little bit of methane, a stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Watch. In the winter, you can actually set it on fire. This is not man-made carbon from factories or highways. Where we're sitting now is probably close to 30,000, 40,000 years old. Methane is formed in millions of lakes around the Arctic where permafrost is thawing. And each year, these lakes are emitting already tremendous amounts of methane. Just how much dangerous gas are we talking here? NASA is using these planes to collect it. Come fly with us after the break. Welcome back, another breathtaking morning here in Alaska where you have those cool nights and the sunshiny mornings coming over the mountains. You get this beautiful fog coming off of any lake that you drive by. But there's another gas coming out of the ground that could be very dangerous up here for the climate. It's something you can't see, but you can smell. This is where you sniff from. NASA has a nose above Alaska. My name's Seth Chasnoff. I'm an engineer with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We have seen the Arctic change. Millions have felt it. And this crew... My name is Chip Miller. In this custom-built plane... The Carve C-23 Sherpa... Can smell it change. We're smelling for carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane. Collect all the gas, store it in these bottles in the case, then ship it off to scientists who will study it. Alaska is warming fast. In the past 50 years, average temperatures are up 3.4 degrees Fahrenheit, twice the national average. The winters are not as cold or as long. A government agency created by President Bush 41 projects Alaska will heat up an additional 7 degrees by 2050. 
That's why NASA is flying this five-year mission to smell Alaska. When the frozen Earth thaws out and unleashes ancient carbon that's been in deep freeze in some cases since the woolly mammoth walked this land. Some 2,000 billion tons of carbon are thought to be sequestered in the frozen soils and permafrost. While much of that is buried way too deep to defrost, globally around the Arctic, up to 20% is actually close enough to the surface to start this massive exhaust of ancient carbon that could rival the carbon humans have pumped into the sky since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Here we have an instrument that is looking down through the port here. Oh, that's an open hole in that, the plane. That is an open hole in the bottom of the plane. <laughs> well, we slid under All the right. plane now. Here we are. Oh, yeah. So this is the port through which the infrared camera looks. We're using it to understand how wet the surface of Alaska really is. As a NASA employee, you have satellites up there, but this is just better resolution. So we can see individual trees and branches as we're flying along. Trees breathe in carbon, that's their job, but humans and animals and thawing permafrost, they breathe it out. We're beginning to see the transition from uh, more of a breathing in to actually more of a breathing out. The more carbon in the air, the hotter it gets. The hotter it gets, the more carbon comes out of the ground. More heat, more carbon, more, heat, more, carbon, more, heat, more, carbon, more heat. It's a loop. That's the problem that we have. And the first Americans to feel it are right here in Alaska. The Alaska natives and the relative newcomers who live here have adapted to countless changes over the centuries. Looks like they'll have to do more of the same going forward, but they are a hardy bunch, the folks who live here at the top of the world. In Alaska, I'm Dave Malkoff. Thanks for watching. This has been a Dave Malkoff production.